Well, hello everyone. I'm Douglas Peak, and I always introduce myself in case you're here for the first time or maybe you're new. Uh, some people are a little used to me because I've been in this church for coming up on 26 years. And so those who've been here a long time are still people of faith because they're hoping that my jokes will get better one day. <laughs> they're still waiting. Now, we're really excited that uh, you're doing uh, uh, here with us, and if you're brand new or if you're watching online, uh, we just want you to know that the best way to connect with us is to just scan that QR code and kind of find out a little bit about who we are. You can, it's also on the back of the chair in front of you. Now, um, if you're interested in baptism, because we've been doing baptisms now, we try to do them on the first Sunday of every month, you can also scan uh, with your cell phone, uh, this FH ba uh, baptism uh, QR code, and there's a little teaching on it. It's all video-based so that you can watch it. Also, uh, we have a lot of other things through this digital discipleship program that you are more than welcome to participate in. And we make that available for you, and we make it available for everyone who is watching online um, at other times. Now, we're starting a brand new series called Jesus is Christmas. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking about how if you take Jesus out of the equation, if you try to just make Christmas secular, uh, people are like, well, it's, you know, there's always good food and there's always a spirit of giving and generosity and people are nicer and kinder and people love the music and you don't, you don't have to believe in Jesus in order to celebrate that. And what we're going to talk about is that, well, actually, if you take Jesus out, then none of those things really mean anything and they lose all of their meaning. And eventually, in just one generation, they will be forgotten. So, we're going to be talking about how Jesus is Christmas, and we're going to start with a very basic premise, and that is, have you ever wondered why you exist? Have you ever wondered why, uh, what the purpose of your life really is? I mean, why are you alive? We kind of have two basic options to choose from. One is that uh, there's really no meaning in the world because it's just a process of natural selection and evolution that we've evolved over time, which in the end means you're a non-spiritual being, you're a scientific materialist, and there's really no point and purpose to your life. Or we were created by God for a reason and a purpose, and that means that your life has some reason for it. So if you ever wonder, why am I here? Well, the reason is, is because you were designed to experience joy. That's why you have a soul and that's why you're alive. It's also why it's so difficult in life and so hard in life when there is no joy. Now, we're going to try to ask a simple question today in this message about why are there so few uh, joy-filled people? Why does joy seem to be something that is ever more rare in people's lives? Well, in order to answer that question, I thought it'd be good to go back and look at history and talk about first century Rome and what happened there. Now, in, during first century Rome, it's very important to realize that Rome had lots of power, a lot of people are unfamiliar with the how incredible Rome really was. They had lots and lots of wealth. The things that they built were engineering feats of marvel. They, they are, the things that they built to, are so opulent, they far um, exceed the things that we're building today even in America. One, one of the things that they did in engineering, Marvin, this is in South France, is an aqueduct. This massive aqueduct that covers this entire canyon with the river running through the bottom of it was built by the Romans almost 2,000 years ago. And at the very top of that aqueduct, uh, what it does is it, there's a three-foot trench in the shape of a V that carried water. So this entire structure was built just for that. Uh, we were able to go and see it when we lived in Italy back in 2016. Uh, we took a jaunt through the south of France down into kind of the east coast of Spain into Barcelona. And so we stopped and we looked at it. And there I am 
gazing at something. Actually, I think I was really tired from the hiking, and it was really hot. It's like 100 degrees out. So, and there's something about Europe. They're just really not into air conditioning that much, you know. It's kind of a rarity. I'm like, man, you guys need to up your game. <laughs> so, but I think people don't realize how advanced Rome really was. And just these building pictures show what they were able to accomplish. Their economy was blowing, their, their military was unquestionably the powerhouse, the, the area that it encompassed was absolutely massive. And yet, in Rome, there was very little joy. When you read their ancient literature and you read about stuff, they, they talked about, you know, joy might be a good thing, but mostly it was about achievement, it was about honors, it was about proving yourself, winning awards, your position in society. It was all about this. There wasn't a lot of joy. And in the midst of this joyless society, where they had all the trappings of what would bring joy to people, but still missing it, there were some shepherds out in the fields watching their flocks late at night. And an angel of the Lord, in chapter 2 of the book of Luke, appears to them and this is what he says. He says, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Will it cause great joy for just a few people? No, for all the people. So the first announcement in the midst of Rome that was so joyless is that Jesus will come and Jesus will bring joy. This is good news. Now compare that today to where we're at. You and I live in America. You may not be aware of this, but America has lots of wealth. We are actually the wealthiest country in the history of the world. Even the poorest in the United States of America are considered to be living in the top 10% of the wealthiest people in the entire globe. That's pretty amazing when you think about it. There's lots of power. Our military power, our political power is uh, unmatched right now. We also have a ton of entertainment. I mean, sports is a billion dollar a year industry. And you can see all kinds of sports. You know, there's football, there's baseball, there's basketball, there's lacrosse. I mean, there's soccer, uh, there's English football. You can watch, I mean, you can even watch curling if you want to. <laughs> and there's so many sports that we pursue to entertain us. The media uh, complex is massive. You know, the movies and the TV shows, we've got uh, YouTube, we've got TikTok. I mean, we got everything to entertain us. But in a world with all this plenty and all of this comfort, why is it that Americans rank like 15th down on the joy and happiness index? I mean, where is the joy? Well, what we are going to talk about is this, is that if there's no Jesus, it doesn't matter how much you have. If there's no Jesus, it doesn't matter how many traditions you observe. If you don't have Jesus, it doesn't matter how much good food you get to eat. If you don't have Jesus, it doesn't matter how many decorations and you put up, doesn't matter how many gifts you give or get. In the end, without Jesus, there's simply no joy. And that's why Jesus is Christmas. So, what we want to do is we kind of want to uh, jump into the announcements of the coming birth of Jesus. Just like the angel showed up in said, look, in the midst of this joyless society, I bring you good news that will bring joy to all the people. See, there were two other announcements. There was one for Mary, and there was also one for Joseph. So let me read those to you, and then we're going to kind of discover what they mean for us. The first one is found in Luke chapter 1, beginning with verse 26. 
Now, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. Now, Elizabeth is a relative of Mary, and she's much older than Mary. Mary's probably somewhere between the ages of 16 and 18 at this time in her life. And Elizabeth is in her late 30s, early 40s. And Elizabeth is the mother of John the Baptist, who was the forerunner. He was the person who came and spoke about the Messiah coming, okay? So in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. Now, it's very important to understand the notion of being pledged or betrothed in marriage. And that is, it was actually a legal agreement as well as a cultural agreement. It's different than being engaged. Now, the reason why they had this, it was a part of Jewish law that they observed, is it had two purposes. First is that when you would get married, you would pay a dowry to the woman's family. And so it allowed you to pay the dowry. I guess you could call it an installment plan, right? You're kind of paying for your future bride. But the other reason why is because that way you would know that she was actually not with child. So if you didn't consummate that during the patrol, then you knew that she was truly not with child before she decided to marry you. So it kind of had two purposes to it. So it's, it's, it's kind of a lot more than just being engaged. And that's important to note later on. Now, the angel went to her and said, greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Now, Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Well, how can this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. Well, the first thing that we see here is one of the earliest historical records of what is commonly known as a gender reveal. (laughs) That's right. You're going to give birth to a boy. That's pretty spectacular about it especially when you see all the gender reveal things going on right now and all the potential for failure like this one. Yeah, hit it. Oh, hit it hard. Oh, man, strike out. Oh, not her. Oh, no. <laughs> And there's his child floating off into nothing. There you go. That didn't turn out well. He's probably sitting there thinking, well, what what are we going to have, you know? Not all gender reveals go. If you're ever having a bad day or a little down, just Google gender reveal fails, and you'll be laughing before you know it. But in all seriousness, I, I think it's really interesting is it starts with the phrase to her, he says, you are favored, one. And then he says, you have found favor in God's sight. So the announcement to Mary from the angel was, you are favored of God. I think 
this is an announcement that's really important for women to hear and to know. And the reason why is because the deepest need of your soul is to be affirmed, to be valued, to be loved, to have the security of knowing that no matter what, you are valued and you are loved, a part of a family. And what's amazing is that today, so many women are disappointed in their husband or their kids or their extended family, growing up in situations where you don't feel loved, you don't feel valued, you don't feel affirmed. These things are difficult for women because the deepest need of your soul is to know that you are completely valued and accepted for who you are. And the beautiful thing about this is look at Mary, this young girl, who found favor with God. Think about that for just a moment. Think about how she wasn't super mom, super career, super business owner, super funny, super beautiful, super successful, super fill in the blank. And yet she was favored of God. You see, to find favor, you don't have to be super woman. You don't have to be super mom. You don't have to be super successful at a career, super business woman. It's fine to be those things, but it's not required to find favor with God. All you have to be is faithful. It's really simple. Just faithful to God. And it's in your faithfulness, the simplicity of life, where you discover the quenching of the greatest thirst for your soul, and that is Jesus Christ. You see, when Jesus was born, the announcement to her was, you, were fi- you found favor with God, now God is coming and moving through you to bring joy to the world. Have you ever thought about that, ladies, for just a moment, that you're meant for joy, right? You are meant and built for happiness, but that has to be found in your soul. It can't be found out there. It can't be found in things. It can't be found in achievements. It can't be found in beauty or acceptance or the praise of other human beings. It has to be found here, deep within your soul. And that's why Jesus is Christmas. Because when you meet Him, you find that you are favored by God. Now let's look at the announcement for Joseph and see what that has to say to the guys. This is in Matthew chapter 1. What's really interesting is is just a side note before I read it, and that is there are four biographies on the life of Jesus, and they're called Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Shock of shocks, they were written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And what's interesting about them is there's four because each one was written to a different audience of people, okay? And Matthew, whose nickname was Levi, he was Jewish, and he wrote his biography on the life of Jesus to prove to all of his Jewish brothers and sisters that Jesus was the fulfillment of the prophesied Messiah, So in Matthew, you see lots of Old Testament references and how Jesus fulfilled those. So I wanted you to have that in your head as I read this announcement to Joseph. Now, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. This is verse 18 of chapter 1 of the gospel according to Matthew. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. Now, you see how they say it a little bit differently here, to give you an idea about the legal aspect of their betrothal. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Now, because Joseph was her husband and faithful to the law, meaning in the law, it says that if you're in a betrothal period of one year and the, the woman is with child and you didn't consummate it, then you were to put her aside or divorce her. Now, It says, yet he did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. 
But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until he gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. So here's Joseph kind of give you a little idea of what he's going from, through, is that he, through various means, and he, maybe he knew Mary, uh, through families that had established a betrothal. And that is, Mary is going to be married to Joseph. So he has one year to come up with money to pay for the dowry. And so he's paying this, you know, making installments. So in his mind, he's got a plan. He's a man with a plan. And he's making payments on it, you know. So it'd be guys like, uh, you know, you have a new thing that you're doing and you're like, you're making payments on it. You're really excited about it. You see this thing playing out. It's all fit. It's all regular. You got the income coming in. You got the schedule out. And then suddenly this massive curveball comes in. In this particular situation, the person that he was betrothed to, the person that he loved, he finds out, she says, I'm pregnant. Now, if you were a guy betrothed to a woman and you knew what your relationship with her had been, that would be a shock. And then she says, with the Holy Spirit. That's the first time we've ever heard that in the history of the world. And he's thinking, okay, I'm honoring the law. I'm going to put her away. So all of his plans have a massive curveball thrown at them. What's amazing is an angel shows up and says, I know what you're considering. I don't want you to be afraid to take her as your wife because what God is doing in her is his will. And what's amazing, it says when he woke up, what did he do? He took what the angel said, because the angel said, don't be afraid to take her as a wife. But he took it as a command. He got up, took her, brought her home, and then didn't constantly, he, no questions asked. He just did it. Man, don't you guys wish you had that kind of clarity in all of your decision making? especially when you're picking stocks or mutual funds. I would love that. You know, you have a dream. Boom, there it is. I'm on it. Hey, I, this is the person that I'm supposed to marry. This is the job I'm supposed to take. Why, why would you love that clarity? Well, one of the reasons why is because, men, one of our deepest needs in our soul is that the work of our hands, the goals we set, the life we live has meaning and purpose to it. Entertainment is fun. Doing things that are adventurous are fun. Having a good time is fun. But unless there is deep meaning and purpose for your existence, those things become empty in your life. Fluff is not enough. You need to know who you are, why you're on the face of this earth and where real authentic joy comes from. Because when you experience joy, it's linked to a clarity about your meaning and purpose and value as a man in your life. You see, this is why at Christmas time, you can celebrate all the stuff out there. You can get presents. You can have fun. You can do this. You can have great food. You can have, see great movies. You can have great walks. You can, do, you can go skiing or snowshoeing or snowmobiling. You can do all of these things. But if there's no Jesus, then there's no meaning to anything you do. And that's why the announcement to Joseph was so important, why it was so powerful. Because what it did is it said to Joseph, this is where 
you will find meaning and purpose, and that is by following the will of God. Now, let's look at what all three of these announcements had in common that speak to all of us in general. The first one was to the shepherds, and what was it? You know, don't be afraid. And then to Mary, what was it? Don't be afraid. And then to Joseph, what did he say? Don't be afraid. Now, do you see a pattern emerging here? What is up? Why is it that they all say, don't be afraid? I think part of the reason for that is because fear influences you and me more than we would like to admit. Fear is a powerful influencer in our lives. You see, we learn fear as children, right? Maybe we're fearful of a monster under the bed or a ghost in the closet or the dark. But then we get up, we get older, we get into middle school, which is a cacophony of fears and rejection that just happen. And then you kind of get older and you're starting to think, wow, um, are people going to you know, if I'm going to date or what I like to date, you know, whether you're in high school or college or whenever, and there's all this fear of acceptance, all this fear of attraction, all this fear of rejection. And then oftentimes in high school, sometimes in college, we have that first relationship. And then for some reason, it just goes crashing and burning, right? And then from that moment on, what happens is that fear of whatever went bad in that relationship influences all of our relationships after that, right? It impacts us in that way. If, if we go and we try to do something, uh, maybe on the playground, we're uh, fearful, guys, of not being picked or being the last one picked to play sports. So then what do we do? From then on, we avoid sports and we try to find our identity in something else. And w w fear has such an influence on everything in our lives. It drives our behavior. It drives our decision-making and it influences all of our relationships. <laughs> Due to fear, oftentimes we can't resolve conflict. At the end of uh, the last series of messages, last Sunday, we wrapped it up talking about conflict resolution. And what happens is, you know that the reason why we have so many conflicts is often driven by a subconscious fear. And then our incapacity to resolve our conflicts comes from what? fear. Fear causes you an inability to relax. You can never relax or decompress. You try to find things that will distract you if you're a guy more and more and more. What we've talked about in the past is how anger is a secondary emotion. Guess what happens when you're fearful? You get more and more angry as a person. Did you know that it's fear that is the primary root cause of all anxiety and panic attacks? It's fear that weakens your immune system. It's fear that bleeds all the confidence and courage out of your life. When you can't make a decision, if you're a procrastinator or if you're a person who can't seem to have the confidence to make decisions, you can't follow through on things. You won't be adventurous. You won't take or do courageous things. It's often because of what? Fear. Subconscious fear. Fear stops us from living life. Fear often stops men from taking responsibility for their life. Fear stops men from being responsible and making good decisions. This notion that, man, I, I, I might miss out on something else if I'm committed to this person or to this thing. Fear stops us, uh, in a lot of ways, from developing memory. This is really amazing. Research has found out that people who live in fear, people have constant fears, they don't conquer their fears, start to lose their memory. But if I were to say the biggest thing that fear does, fear is the number one toxin to joy. Fear is the number one barrier to joy. The more fear you have in your life is in direct proportion to how little joy you will experience. And if left unaddressed, fear 
will control you in ways you never imagined. And so what could I share with you today is that the people in the first century had every reason to be afraid. Under the oppression of the Roman Empire, under what was going on in their nation, and what, all of the things that were happening, they had every reason to be afraid. Joseph had a plan on what his life was going to look like, and it got completely turned upside down. He had every reason to be afraid. Mary, her whole life, totally turned upside down. All of her, play, uh, her plans, wondering how am I going to be ever valued in this society when people think that I'm going to go through being pregnant without even being year, married yet during this betrothal. But what happened? The angels showed up and said, don't be afraid. One of the things that we have to understand is that if we're built for joy, we want to experience joy, then we have to address and overcome our fear. And if the last 24 months have taught Americans anything, you have to admit is that life is much more difficult than we ever imagined. Our economy is much more fragile than we could have ever imagined. Our health is so much more fragile than we could ever imagine. Our lives are filled with tragedy. They're filled with difficulties. They're filled with failures. It's completely a lack of control. We have every reason to fear, but let us not fear. Let us set our sights on joy. Let us discover that Jesus is joy. And it's in Him that we discover true and authentic joy. We may have every reason, you may have every reason to be afraid. But don't forget, 2,000 years ago, the angel showed up and said, What? Don't be afraid. Jesus is coming. And so the message for you today is don't be afraid. Jesus is showing up. And that's why Jesus is always going to be and always will be Christmas.